also the uh, Chicago Chef of the APA being uh, host. Uh, I'm going to mention a variety of perspectives, but I want to underscore what you just said. Um, the economy of the future is going to be based on information. That's going to be digital information, and therefore you need the infrastructure to do that. Uh, because of the last history of 200 years, infrastructure committees and planning committees don't give that much consideration, even though it's critically important. So um, I'm going to begin by um, noting I'm going to talk about a lot of concepts very fast. And, and this is to give you some general ideas, macro ideas, not all the details. If you want all the details, we have the details. But we can do that at a, at a later bit. Um, I'm going to first introduce our center, just a, a tad, and then I'm going to talk about applications and the way that we conceive of applications, and these are not consumer applications. Uh, I'm also going to talk about some infrastructure and then some facilities that are in place today that most people don't know about but are pretty important. Um, so who we are, um, we basically are a research center at Northwestern University. What we do is design and implement and prototype large-scale digital communications infrastructure. Uh, international networks, national networks, statewide networks, regional networks, and metropolitan area networks. We don't do enterprise. We don't do consumer. Uh, we work with uh, the largest data and most data-intensive applications in the world, uh, middleware, which fits between those applications and infrastructure. Large-scale infrastructure, including computational grids, supercomputers, uh, working on petascale uh, computers coming into several facilities, optical networking, uh, test beds, and uh, networks. We also work in public policy studies at the federal, state, and local level. And that's because um, if technologists don't talk about policy at some level, uh, it seems like only conversations are being held by mainly lawyers. And uh, we want to widen that uh, spectrum, not to say there's anything wrong with lawyers. Uh, three areas of basic activity, uh, basic research, uh, the design and implementation of large-scale prototypes, and then we operate specialized facilities. Um, conceptually now, just people say, okay, what's happening in the area of advanced communications? What's the real difference between what we have now and what we have in the future? And this slide is attempting to explain that. Traditionally, the way communication services have been provided uh, is through what is called a carrier cloud. You have an invisible type of carrier cloud where you have several hardened services. So the services are very well defined. The technologies that support those services are very well defined. And you have a few services uh, being uh, provided with limited functionality and uh, limited flexibility. So you've heard that term triple play, right? That means three services, or quadruple play, that means four. Well, that's what's happening now, and uh, that's fine. That served the world to date, but that's not the future. The problem with that model is it's very restricted. If you have a new service or an enhanced service, or you want to do something quickly, you can't with that model. So instead, you have to design something else, something that looks fundamentally different. This is a large-scale distributed facility based on fiber optics that's infinitely programmable. And uh, one thing that happens continually is that people come along and they say, I have a new service and I want to put it on the infrastructure, and they're told, sorry, it wasn't created for that. But this new infrastructure is created for that. It's a programmable infrastructure. It's incredibly flexible. You can have not just three services, not just four, but hundreds. You can have thousands. It's unlimited. And that's the design that we're creating now and we're implementing. As in those are goals, or that's a reality? It's a reality today for some people. But the future doesn't come to everybody all at once. And so I'll, I'll explain where it is in place. A lot of this is driven by large-scale science. Uh, large-scale science hits technology barriers before other communities, and therefore they have to solve those problems first. And this is why a lot of the innovations that people are using now in the consumer space have their roots in science. Uh, most people are unaware of the fact that web servers were developed at CERN, the particle physics lab in uh, Switzerland. Uh, 
Um, most people are unaware that the web browser was created at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications in Urbana-Champaign, and it was created as a viewer for high-energy physics data and documents virtually. That's where it came from. And I'm, again, I'm going to go quickly through some of this. Um, what's driving a lot of uh, high-end uh, considerations these days in data-intensive applications uh, for, is uh, Large Hadron Collider, which comes online this year at CERN. This is uh, an image of it. This is the world's largest uh, particle accelerator. The scientists have been planning for this for 20 years. Um, the networkers uh, for over 10 years. Uh, it will generate more data than any other science experiment on the planet. It's a multi-billion dollar experiment. And we in Chicago are a major participant. Uh, we will be distributing this data around the world through specialized facilities there. Um, one of the facilities uh, intimately connected with the project working on it is the Fermi National Accelerator Lab. Uh, this is an image of uh, Fermi Lab. It's out in Batavia, Illinois. Uh, we have an international exchange at uh, the downtown campus of Northwestern, where I am. It's just a few blocks from here. Um, and uh, the folks in Batavia needed to get their tens of gigabits uh, per second channels into the city. In order to do that, what they did was they bought dark fiber from Commonwealth Edison, and now they have channels where they're uh, putting that data. They have their own private network, and one of the themes here is private networks. Uh, the uh, higher education community has purchased 36,000 miles of dark fiber to create private networks because that is the only way to get these specialized services today. Um, notice it says 35 miles land find is starlight. Um, that is uh, a specialized protocol that allows for very, very low cost uh, transmission over optical fibers. And um, that uh, allows for the science to happen uh, not only uh, addressing issues of capacity, but also flexibility, but also cost. Um, the cost here is a fraction of what it ordinarily would cost. Um, another data generator coming is uh, magnetic fusion energy. Uh, this is going to be important for all of us. It's one of those alternative <coughs> energy sources uh, created by uh, fusion. The Spallation Neutron Source, which is a specialized instrument that will be implemented at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, 3D modeling and simulation. Uh, the 777 was the proof of concept that was uh, digitally designed, and now uh, this is a technique used by engineers worldwide in transportation, uh, in aerospace, in uh, shipping, in, in automotive. Uh, and it's also used for many other industries, including uh, uh, architecture. Uh, haptics, where you get physical feedback from dealing with the 3D objects, uh, this used in medical training as well as engineering, uh, so that you can actually interact with 3D objects as uh, they did on the uh, holodeck of Star Trek, you remember that? Uh, we work with the federal agencies. Uh, one agency is USGS. They have images that are 10,000 times more detailed than the Landsat 7 data, and we're working with them on ways of transporting that data to the people that need it. Um, the aerial imaging for USGS is uh, desired at six inches. I'm discussing now with um, the Illinois Department of Transportation the potential for getting that data out of Sioux Falls. They have a link into our facility, and they would like to use that uh, data uh, more uh, uh, directly and quickly. The aerial imaging is 500,000 times more detailed than Landsat 7. And, uh, Again, all of these applications I'm showing you are very data intensive. They require uh, bandwidth far in excess of anything that's commonly available. This is why we create these private networks in order to, to generate these data. These are huge data sets uh, in order to have many images um, with uh, four centimeter pixel resolutions and be able to uh, uh, send those around. Um, we deal with a variety of uh, organizations that deal with crisis uh, response, uh, those folks want 3D data, they want interactive data, they want to integrate that data, and they want to send it around. So imagine a, a terabyte email going to 100 different places at the same time. Uh, we work with uh, the communities working on uh, weather models. When Katrina happened, uh, because of the poor networking, it took the analysts two weeks to get the data that they needed uh, in the first few hours. Uh, 
uh, because simply it wouldn't flow over those old, old networks. Uh, we work with climate modeling, doing um, interactive models of oceanography and atmospherics. Uh, Chicago has become the center of uh, correlations of radio telescope data. In the old days, what they used to do, in fact, some people are still doing this, they ship data in canisters, then do the correlations in rooms. But because we can now send this data over these optical pipes um, at very high speeds, that's a layer three network, a layer two network and not a layer three network. Because we can do this so quickly, people can correlate in real time and they can do their instrumentation adjustments in real time. And so most people don't realize this, but Chicago is the center of uh, radio telescope uh, research worldwide. We just put in a new telescope to uh, Puerto Rico, uh, a new connection of telescope in Puerto Rico, the Arecibo uh, telescope. And we do, we've been doing about one of these uh, a lot. <coughs> Uh, another area is uh, remote instrumentation. There are many multi-million dollar large-scale specialized instruments being uh, developed around the world and uh, scientists uh, need to use those uh, collaboratively. The only way to link into them is with these high-speed networks uh, so that they can interactively work on their samples. This is uh, the most powerful electron microscope in the world in Osaka, Japan. Uh, this is a project that um, I worked on with uh, the University of California, San Diego, and the University of Illinois at Chicago. It was funded by the um, National Science Foundation, $13.5 million project to create basically virtual instruments for uh, two reference uh, science disciplines, one bioinformatics and one uh, geophysical sciences. And uh, what this is showing is some scientists looking at uh, a slice of a rat brain where they can interrogate that image and uh, deeply delve into it, including getting into the cell and looking at the cell structures without loss of resolution. And we can put these data sets in a foreign country. When we first showed this, the data set was in Amsterdam. We were bringing it to Chicago. Um, another area which has to do with drug design uh, and molecular modeling uh, is uh, large-scale computational research using many computers in different countries hooked up with optical networks. Uh, we supported linking uh, computers in the United Kingdom to those in the United States uh, to um, run this uh, uh, model that uses steered molecular dynamics to pull DNA strands through uh, a channel protein. On normal servers, this would have run 25 years, and uh, it ran very quickly on, uh, on this uh, distributed fabric. Um, another uh, community that we have uh, <coughs> working with is uh, this one, which is putting fiber under the ocean to collect data and digital video from under the ocean to do analysis. This is under uh, the ocean <coughs> under the west coast of the United States. And uh, this is a telecrawler that goes down and uh, goes across the ocean floor, collects data and images, and then plugs itself into fiber optic cable both to upload the data, but then there's another plug where it can plug itself in and get uh, power. So those cables also have power under the ocean. Very sophisticated model that uses this different kind of communication system, not the one that's uh, commonly used. Um, and this project is one that developed out of the one that I mentioned, that National Science Foundation project. Um, this was uh, conceived by Craig Venter, who did uh, the first uh, sequencing of the human genome, he asked uh, Gordon Moore, uh, who founded Intel, for $24.5 million to do a production version of that prototype uh, that we had done. And that is now in place. That's Craig Venter on his boat, the Sorcerer 2. He went around the world and took these microbial samples um, in order to uh, examine the, um, uh, the genome sequences and the proteomic sequences in these microbial uh, life forms. Uh, he has uh, contributed uh, substantially to the known knowledge of, um, of proteins uh, based on this experiment. He's creating a whole new science. Uh, what we helped uh, him with is creating a distributed virtual instrument which runs from Southern California as a computational farm through the Starlight facility here in Chicago to his labs in Rockville, Maryland, used as a contiguous uh, a scientific instrument. Um, this is another use of that technology, and what this is showing is uh, capability of specialized displays to see um, a microbial genome 
uh, data in a way that it makes it easy to interrogate. So you can zoom in and zoom out and see great details and without having, again, these big channels uh, uh, made possible by the optical networks that would not be possible. Uh, this is uh, computational astrophysics, uh, which we showed for the first time a few years ago, demonstrating that you can do distributed, uh, large-scale, data-intensive sciences and scientific modeling uh, if you use optical networks. Uh, we're working with the National Center for Learning and Teaching on nanoscale science and engineering. Chicago has become a center of nanotechnologies. Uh, one of the projects that we're working on is creating virtual instruments for uh, scientific research, and this is one of these instruments. You can choose uh, the color of the light source, the wavelength that is appearing in nanometers. You can choose the slit size. You can run an experiment that creates a large media object that you can uh, send around. Um, this is another uh, experiment that shows a high-end uh, visualization. as a very large uh, data set. This is about 850 megabytes. Um, and what you're seeing is uh, some experiments that are investigating methods for using wavelengths to uh, substitute for normal electrical modes in um, components. We do a lot of work in digital media. Um, some years ago, uh, this is the year 2000, we created the world's first global internet digital video network based on layer three technologies. Uh, these days, we're using layer two technologies. We're creating specialized networks for high-performance digital media, including what's called 4K media. That's 4,000 pixels, horizontal 2,000 uh, vertical. It's four times the definition of HDTV and 24 times DVD. Uh, so it's very sharp. It's spectacular. Uh, the industry um, that is um, uh, concerned with media is, is buying into this technology. There's a, a project that's commercializing it. It's called the Syngrid Initiative. So it's moving out of research labs. It's moving out of uh, the prototypes and is now uh, going into standards bodies and into um, production. There's actually two theaters in the world now that do uh, 4K media. One is in Los Angeles. One is in Tokyo. Uh, we have here in Chicago uh, the core hub of a national fabric, which is the only one in the world that can do 4K media streaming. And uh, we've been using that for the last uh, year and a half. Uh, we supported the first class ever taught in HD. Uh, it was taught by Thomas Sterling, uh, who's at Louisiana State University. Uh, it's multi-site, um, University of Arkansas, uh, North Carolina, and uh, Masaryk University in Brunei, Czech Republic. This was 1.5 gigabits per second from all those sites to all those sites, okay? And so the thing to think about there is it's important to teach people in HD to, you know, multi-site collaboration is the future. You can't do 1.5 gig from many sites to many sites with T1 lines, right? This is why we need the optical fiber. This is why we need it get beyond the thoughts of just consumer technology for schools. Schools deserve more than consumer technologies. Um, we're creating an international network to do this type of, me of uh, media. It's called the HVDM network, High Performance Digital Media Network. Um, it uses a specialized technique called optical multicast, which I won't go into because it can get detailed. But we showed this for the first time in Prague in the Czech Republic. and. Uh, displayed uh, uh, kind of <coughs> media extravaganza, including uh, digital streaming from Akihabara in Tokyo. But later, we also did one in The Hague in the Netherlands uh, for uh, something called E-Challenges, sponsored by the European Union. And the neat thing about that was we um, took that international network, and remember I said it was programmable, we uh, reprogrammed that to support another uh, conference that took place in Barcelona within 24 hours. Uh, so put that in perspective, uh, imagine just asking for uh, a normal service provider to do a custom international network within 24 hours, um, changing that from one city to another in Europe. Well, we can do that. Uh, we also showed that at uh, supercomputing last year, 
And uh, as I said, we have facilities that can do this. This is a facility called Starlight. It is the most advanced uh, communication facility in the world. It has uh, uh, over 50 10 gigabit per second links going worldwide. I'll show you some of the maps to where they're going. Uh, this is on the downtown campus in Northwestern. It's across street from where our offices are. Um, on the inside, it looks like a regular um, uh, point of presence, but it has a lot of specialized uh, facilities inside it. Um, we use it for experiments. We support currently 15 testbed networks. This is one that we supported a few years ago. Uh, it's a photonics testbed. Each one of these links is a 10 gigabit per second link. So that's 240 gigabits worth of capacity. Um, we're founding partners of the Global Lambda Integrated Facility. This is a worldwide facility. What you see there is not all the networks we connect to. This is just fiber links that we connect to. We're part of a consortium that's running a distributed facility based on optical fiber. So all of those links are optical fibers. Uh, this is a closer view of uh, just this in the United States. And you should know, for those of you from Chicago, the core hub is Chicago, so that's very important to us, and uh, it provides for an enormous opportunity. What this means is Chicago is a world leader in advanced communications, and one of the comments I've made to a number of people is, wouldn't it be nice to get this to a wider community? Because right now, um, we can use this, and uh, we're doing it uh, to good effect, but it's not yet out into that wider community. So. That's something that needs to be uh, done. Um, we work with the Canadians who are very um, uh, forward-looking in their advanced uh, optical networking uh, policies and implementations. Uh, they have a core hub for their national optical network in uh, Chicago. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, we work with those uh, folks also. Uh, United Kingdom, uh, Czech Republic, which is doing a major uh, national optical uh, network. Um, many of the Asia Pacific countries, uh, including Korea, uh, which has a 10 gigabit per second link into our facility. And here is uh, Japan. Japan is very forward looking. Uh, I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about Japan. Japan uh, has um, this network, uh, this is called JGN2. It's a $140 million testbed network. And part of that is a $14.5 million link, uh, which connects to Starlight so that they can do uh, research. And um, they are um, currently, uh, they've already put about 10 million homes directly on fiber. And uh, soon they'll have 20 million homes on fiber. They are unrolling a 1 gigabit per second um, service to the home. They're planning for a 10 gigabit per second uh, service to the home. Uh, there's some people in this country who are saying that broadband shouldn't be changed uh, from the definition of 200 kilobits. Um, all you good planners out there should have a different opinion. <coughs> um, this is another very wonderful resource for Chicago. It's called Gloriad. It's funded by a variety of governments. And uh, the original partnership was U.S., Russia, China. Um, Colin Powell was the endorser of this project when it got started. Uh, when he was Secretary of State. Um, he was later joined by Korea, Netherlands, Canada, and the Scandinavian countries. Um, this project has created a digital ring that goes around the world. It goes from Chicago to Amsterdam to Moscow to the science cities in eastern Russia to Beijing and Hong Kong. In fact, it's supporting multiple dozens and dozens of projects in advanced science and engineering. It's a new resource. Uh, WARN is the Western Hemisphere Research and Engineering Network, uh, being uh, sponsored by the National uh, Science Foundation. Notice once again, this is a ring. It goes from Chicago to the East Coast to Miami uh, to Sao Paulo, Santiago, and then up to Tijuana, and then there's a little bit of a fiber jumper over to the scenic network of California and back. It's just uh, a terrific uh, 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 resource. TerraGrid is... Um, a uh, distributed computational facility with a core hub here in Chicago made possible by uh, uh, light path based networks. Uh, it's a $140 million project. And then uh, in Illinois, we have many, many uh, testbed networks, including the first uh, statewide instrumentation optical fiber network called iWire, um, and uh, many others. There's also the distributed optical testbed 
and uh, something called OmniNet. Uh, nationally, we're part of a consortium that created the National Lambda Rail, which is uh, a national optical uh, infrastructure. So this cost $80 million, and it was uh, put together by um, a number of universities. Uh, we work with the federal agency networks. This is the DOE network. Um, it, is ex it is in Chicago now. It is at the facility, but it's expanding, and this is what it will look like in 2010 to 11. Uh, we work with the Department of Energy's Ultra Science Network, uh, the Ultra Light Network, which is a $4 million network being sponsored by the National Science Foundation for Physics, uh, the Bioinformatics Research Network, the Defense Research and Engineering Network, NASA's Information Science Network, as well as lots of private pipes employed by Goddard. And then um, there's also in the area, this is a regional network, um, the Metropolitan Research and Education Network, uh, which created the world's first gigapop and is now creating the first uh, terapop. Um, and there's a book on programmable networks called Grid Networks. A grid is a technology that was invented locally at Argonne National Lab, and uh, this is the extension of that programmable environment to uh, networks. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll close.